we had a very sad incident. We had a, a Ontario provincial police officer who was shot responding to a car in the ditch. The funeral was held last week. Then we had another incident where a group of teenagers beat a elderly man in Toronto to death. Uh, I think there were eight teenagers, 13 years old. Another tragic story. And it just seems like, what is going on? Do you not just get that feeling? These are disturbing patterns and trends that I have seen since the Trudeau government has uh, has uh, come into power in 2015. Since that particular time, uh, crime across this country has increased year after year after year. And it was one of the driving factors, really, Jamie, why I chose to leave uh, 30 years of, of work as a Crown prosecutor, because I said this existing system is just not working. It's failing Canadians. It's putting communities at risk. The police don't have enough tools. They don't have enough resources. They don't have enough funding to ensure that these communities are, uh, are safe. And uh, policies introduced by the Trudeau government literally since 2015 have created this sense of entitlement that uh, criminals have in this community that there are no long-term consequences. When it comes to bail, it's a catch and release mentality that a lot of these people have, knowing full well that regardless of their background, regardless of the nature of the offense that they've committed, um, they have a very good chance of receiving some form of bail. Uh, they make promises uh, to the courts, they make promises uh, to Crown attorneys that they'll abide by the conditions, but they don't. The sureties who provide uh, supervision over these individuals make similar pro uh, promises uh, daily to, uh, to judges that they'll be the eyes and the ears of the court, and they turn a blind eye. So to your example, the unfortunate uh, killing of the OPP officer, that should have never happened. Should have never happened for a number of reasons. This person had a very lengthy criminal record. He was on bail for serious related offenses. He was on the highest form of judicial interim release in terms of house arrest and electronic monitoring. He was initially denied bail by the courts. After so many months, he bought a, brought a bail review. He convinced a superior court justice that they should take a chance on his release, and he was released. Um, his very first return date to court, he failed to show up, and he was on the lam for four months. Um, he had two weapon prohibitions that didn't stop him from acquiring probably an illegally obtained weapon, although that's not been confirmed. I think we can surmise that when he took the steps to uh, be in possession of a, of a firearm, a gun, a pistol that had uh, the serial numbers uh, sawed off or sanded off, that it was probably illegal. And um, there has just been a failure, a failure in so many steps, a failure by the court systems, a failure by the, the uh, supervisors to ensure the, the safety of the community. And uh, the police didn't have the resources to actively look for this individual for close to four months when there was a bench warrant issued for his arrest. So <clears throat> again, to my point, this Trudeau government has created an atmosphere that people believe that they can continue to be exhibiting their lifestyles in a, in a lawless behavior and uh, with very few consequences. And it's putting communities at risk and so substantial changes need to be made, Jamie. Well, I did notice for those outside Ontario, I do apologize for this, but I do notice that Toronto City Council, the Police Services Board, which made a decision that goes to council at a later date, had a very controversial decision, which was whether or not to hire 200 more officers to deal with some of the exact problems you're talking about going on in the city of Toronto, which is the, the, the feeling of just being unsafe no matter where you're going right now, because the, the criminals seem to have uh, a very, very confident, if you will, uh, atmosphere around them that they can almost do whatever they want. Yes. And again, this is something that has not generated overnight. This is a pattern of government policies uh, since 2015 that have allowed these individuals to feel emboldened in their ability to terrorize communities and, and act with almost impunity. When you have a liberal government, a federal government telegraphing on one hand, 
We're all about community safety. We're all about ensuring the safety of victims. And then you introduce and pass Bill C-5, which takes all the most serious gun offenses in the criminal code, all of the drug offenses in the criminal code, and you remove all the mandatory minimum penalties and say that you're all about community safety, well, there's a disconnect there. And the only message is to the criminals, and I've mentioned this numerous times in the House, I've accused the, 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 uh, the justice minister, I've accused the prime minister, uh, Bill Blair, Mendicino, I've accused them all that criminals are laughing in their faces. They're thanking the liberal government for making it easier with no long-term significant consequences should they be caught. Where did we come as a society to take a drug trafficker, a drug trafficker who ought to be, if convicted, sentenced to a significant period of prison time? Why do we remove that ability for someone who wishes to traffic in fentanyl, the most dangerous and lethal poison available in this particular country and around the world, most of these traffickers traffic out of their own houses. And here we have our liberal government allowing them to continue to serve their sentence in the comfort of their own home. So it is a, such a real disconnect with the reality on the streets. But at the bottom, at the end of the day, the bottom line, Jamie, is all of these policies are contributing to the lack of trust that Canadians have in our institutions. I think on the one hand, I think people have a, a, an appreciation for law enforcement, but they only understand, they understand that there is only so much that law enforcement can do. They're great at investigating, they're great at, at uh, arresting these individuals, removing them temporarily off the streets. They get placed in the hands of the criminal justice system and we have a failure. So we have to talk about some serious, serious bail reform issues and equipping our police agencies across this country with the appropriate tools so that they can carry out their mandate to keep our community safe. And we've talked about before a few weeks ago with yourself, Glenn Motts from, uh, uh, from Alberta as well, about the, the firearm confiscation. Well, nobody, you know, it, it, they call it a buyback program, but I don't know any firearms owner who actually bought their firearm from the government. So it's, it's not a, a buyback program, right? It's, it's a confiscation. And, and I think this goes to the, the broader point that you were making as well. When, when people are feeling this way, when they're paying their taxes and expecting certain services, certain basic things to be done in their community. One is public safety and keeping the bad people behind bars, uh, you know, the, the repeat violent offenders behind bars so that they can actually see value for their tax money so they can actually continue on with their lives. But if they're being victimized over and over again and they don't feel safe, but they're being asked over and over again to pay more and more taxes, that's when this, this breakdown, they, you know, it, it's just like the government is basically telling people, stop complaining, but keep paying your taxes, actually work harder, you're going to take home less. We're going to take more and we'll decide what's better for you. This is the cycle that we seem to be in. Couldn't agree more. It, uh, like this, I know we need to change the government. We had a confidence vote. I know we get lots of comments in the, in the feed here about confidence vote. We had one shortly before the break. Uh, we had a confidence vote so that if it had failed, uh, we would have went into the election. Unfortunately, the NDP sided with the, the liberals and kept them in power. And, and this is the, the cycle. So this is why we ask, I think, your social media and, and others in our caucus, they're doing their things to try to get this message out that to, to keep pushing back, to tell people there is an alternative, there is a better path. No question. And um, yeah, I just, I've just been following our leader in the last couple of weeks, Jamie, and he has done a lot of media requests and, and uh, issued a number of press releases. He is He's tapping into a level of disconnect sorry, a discontent that uh, Canadians have across this country. Uh, the issue regarding affordability, the issue of the brokenness that people have, the despair that people have, the hurt that people have, uh, the concern for their safety. He is tapping in to uh, the reality 
of what Canadians are talking about. He is not talking out of both sides of, of, of his mouth that we often accuse the prime minister and his ministers and his government of doing. He's actually responsive to the needs of Canadians. And that's what Canadians, in my view, should expect from a responsible, competent federal government. And the contrast between a Polyev-led government and a Trudeau or whoever is going to replace Trudeau could not be vastly different than it is right now. We are offering hope. We are offering a plan. And we are going to ensure that in, in the area of criminal justice, that reforms are being tabled. I know that a number of my colleagues and our colleagues, uh, Jamie, I should say, are, are toying around with putting together some private member bills to make some significant changes to the area regarding bail to reflect some of the inadequacies that uh, we've always known about the bail system, but also to tap into the disconnect that's actually happening in our courts across this country.